Hey everybody, welcome back to the Petapixel Podcast. It's Jordan Drake here with my Petapixel Podcast pals. We got, who's that over there? It's Chris Nichols. <laughs> Hi, me again. And also we've got Jaron Schneider. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, you're like, that's the Jaron I, I know and recognize. But what you can't see is the grievous damage that's been done that's just slightly outside of the frame. We're going to be talking about that later. But if he waves, you'll be like, oh, man, something's going down. Right With the now. other hand, I'm fine. Oh, there you go. I thought okay. it was some sort of anime cosplay thing you were doing. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we'll anyways, get to that later. <laughs> Jaren, so we, we weren't sure if this one was going to go last night. That was a conversation. It's like, let's see how this all shakes out. But we're all here. We're all thrilled to be here. Right, everybody? Yeah, yes. Thrilled. Yeah, Happy. great. Joyful. I'm going to kick. I'm going to kick things off with a question like I always like to. So you get to know all of us a little bit better. Um, guys, it has been a huge month for like high end, like prestige TV, they like to call it. We've had the bear season three drop. We just had uh, presumed innocent on Apple TV, fantastic show, but they did it in two different ways. The bear followed the Netflix model where they just throw all the episodes out on the same day. Like, boom, here's the whole season. There you go. Go watch it in whatever order you want. Presumed innocent did the classic television model of releasing one episode a week um, now I want to know what is your preference guys? Hmm. Mm. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's funny. I think spiritually, yes. I prefer <laughs> the every week, you know what I mean? Because it, it makes me feel like, Oh, you got to build up the anticipation. You wait for it. You're excited. But, but from a convenient standpoint, from a slovenly standpoint, I just want it all now, instant gratification, so I can binge watch it. And actually, Presumed Innocent was fantastic. My wife and I watched it. But because we got to it late, we binge watched like the first six episodes and then the final episode we had to wait. So that was actually a really nice mix where you get to binge up to it and then you get that little anticipation at the end. Mm, and it was worth it. So oh. your ideal would be they do the weekly dump and then you just wait till right towards the end. And then you still get that experience of like watching the finale with everybody else and having an opinion yes. the same time everyone Be else gets because there. Because you're forgetting another incredible piece of TV that's been out. And that is a uh, blind date or, you know, things like, of course, uh, yes, <laughs> you know, yeah, not even um, the weekly, the, the, the like four or five episodes a week model. Uh, for oh yeah. yeah only yeah, yeah. the most tight as a drum, well edited, um, carefully oh, conceived. The program. Wire. I mean, blind date. And so, you know, something like, like that, they do binge everything, except they make you wait for those last few episodes. So that's kind of cool. Okay, that's so your hybrid preference. model. Jaron? Um, I like the weekly model. I The reason I like it is because I enjoy, I use threads a lot. And before that, I used Twitter before it turned into a dump. But I mm -hmm. like threads and I like watching conversations from other people, like what people think. I also like Reddit, which is very similar. Um, so I like it when everyone is talking about the same thing and no one knows what's coming next. Um, maybe it's also from the perspective that I like anime and anime is, you know, still in the classic TV model. Yeah. Just so, staggered as it's so you get, that's right. So we all get to enjoy something together. <laughs> and I think there is some joy in, this is like one of the things I like about social media. One of the very few is yeah. everyone gets to enjoy the same thing together. Um, so like when that was happening with Shogun, for example, I love that. Right. Like we all were like, oh my God, this is such a, even though some people who've read the books already knew what was going to happen, the way the show managed to make it still interesting, I thought was really good. So I'm on the, uh, the staggered release. See, I, I was all about like the big episode dump thing until our recent trip to Phoenix, which coincided with the bear being released. So we were like working, you know, for that 48 hours really hard. And by that point, everyone already had reactions for the entire final season before I got home. And that's what made me just throw up my hands and be like, no, I am now team weekly television dump release. Uh, well, and the presumed in a big in this difference was great too. It makes a big difference for the, the, the show, whoever they're hosting or like Hulu or Disney plus or whatever is they get consistent talk about it over a longer yeah. period. And I think that's right. better for the health of a show. Then, yeah. just, you know, dumping. I just try to I avoid social media, like all the releases and well, you should. So social media like is a that. cancer, yeah. and you should get rid because of because you're you right. It makes you it terrible. And and you're right. Like if they do a dump, undoubtedly you're going to run into spoilers. And yeah. even if you're trying not to, it just happens. And so yeah. that sucks, right? Yeah. That's always annoying. Yeah. Um. Yeah. All right. We we, we got to the bottom of it roughly. Back to Team Weekly. Okay. 
Uh, guys, we got actually a pretty interesting show. So we just released our Nikon Z6 III final review. Um, there's some interesting things there that we want to just talk about in a little bit more depth uh, than we were able to on the episode. The notorious flicker issue that everybody's losing their minds about that will affect very few. Of you. Anyways, I'm spoiling my opinion on this. Uh, but we got some other fun news as well. We are talking about Sigma releasing some lenses to work with the A9 III 120 frame per second mode, but with some serious caveats there. The fi fanciest and finest Q3 grip was just released and also fine and fancy. We've got an underwater housing for a Leica M6, just like it's uh, 1974. Um, <laughs> Speaking, of also, film, right? Speaking of yes, film, right? Yeah, Harman is really investing in film development again, which is really exciting to see. So hopefully the film craze keeps going and there's cool new features for Pentax cameras, but currently only if you're Japanese. So man, that's a small audience. We're cutting even smaller, but uh, it's going to be a great show. Let's get into it. All right, before we get going, I want to give some thanks to our podcast sponsor, OM System. OM System are innovators behind some of the most versatile and high-quality lenses on the market. And they've got some incredible deals on M Zuiko lenses now through the end of September that are perfect for expanding your photography toolkit. In fact, some of these lenses are at their lowest price ever. So if wide-angle photography is your passion, the M Zuiko ED7-14 f2.8 Pro Lens is a game-changer. With its expansive 7-14mm, so that's like a 14mm full-frame equivalent, and bright 2.8 aperture, you can capture breathtaking landscapes with exceptional clarity. And right now, you can get it for only $1,000? cents, $9 $400 off the regular <laughs> price of... $1,399.99. It's a fantastic opportunity to add this powerhouse lens to your yes, collection. Yes, powerhouse. Powerhouse, baby. It's a game, game changer. changer. Powerhouse. For those who love creative and immersive perspective, the M's Wico 8mm f1.8, that's one bright fisheye. It offers a 180 degree field of view in a fast 1.8 aperture. Oh, that thing I just said. It's perfect for unique shots that stand out. And with a special price of $799.99, $300 off the usual $1,100, it's an excellent chance to explore this lens's extraordinary capabilities. But wait, wait, wait. I get to talk about my favorite, covering a range from wide angle to a little bit of a zoom, bit of that normal focal length. The M Zuiko 8-25 F4 Pro Lens features a consistent F4 aperture, making it ideal for various shooting scenarios. You can purchase it now for $699.99, $700, which is $400 off its regular price. This lens is brilliant. It's got a focus clutch. It's wonderful for video. I love this lens. It's a great all-around lens, perfect for any photographer. Jordan's going to get a second one. <laughs> I should just, my, my whole backdrop should just be eight to 25s in various yes, colors. I'll hand get. paint them. Yes. Can you, but also being that cheap, by the way, like no, this you, is definitely the least yeah, expensive. Like for deal. that price, just get one immediately. I'll bring it. It'll but make it doesn't you happy. There. No, it's not. It's, I'm not done yet. Talking about small and incredibly powerful, don't forget the M's Wico Digital ED 40 to 150 f4 Pro telephoto lens, which delivers stunning clarity and precision, but it's like super bitty, and it's currently priced at $599.99, $600, $300 off the usual $900, a remarkable value for such a high performance and incredibly compact lens. All these lenses are part of the Micro Four Third system, renowned for its compact, lightweight design and superb image quality. So thanks to OM Systems, you can enjoy high performance and versatility in a small package in your photography. So if you're ready to take advantage of these exceptional <coughs> deals, visit your local authorized OM System retailer or visit explore.omsystem.com slash petapixel. That last part's important. I want the credit when you click and go there. Uh, check that out today. <laughs> credit. Great job, Jordan. Great yeah, job with good. that ad read. Uh, the only thing I would critique, the only thing I critique is you said game changer and powerhouse, but you didn't throw like this lens is a beast in there. That's true. Head. I didn't. You missed uh, the trifecta. So of these, what would you, because beast is generally like a big lens. I don't know. What would you consider the beast of this list, Chris? Uh, I mean, I guess like the, oh, the eight mil fisheye. No, it's tiny. Your yeah. eight to 25 F4 is pretty big. No, it's not. You would call tiny. it tiny. 
Well, yeah, you would call it. A you know what? I'm throwing movie. another one on. Check out the uh, 150 to 400. That lens is a beast. Is it on sale? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's no. on sale right now, but, but it's those are really lens. good deals. Those yeah. are really good prices. Yeah. All right. Well, before it is not on sale, I just checked. Before uh, <laughs> we probably get, still back ordered. <laughs> before we get too far into this, I want to mention if there's any weird noises you hear on my end, it's because I got some guys that are like putting in uh, some work in the yard, and they may be pouring gravel soon. So uh, apologies for Ooh. the sounds of labor. Um, you but have guys in your backyard. Yeah. All right. So moving on, let's talk some news. There's uh, quite a bit happened this past week that I thought was worth yeah. covering. So let's get into it. First up, Sigma has made a firmware update to several of its lenses that brings them into compatibility with the A93's 120 frames per second shooting mode. Jordan, you saw this earlier this week and we're like, check this out. This I is was sweet. Like, Jaren, 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 check it out. Check it out. He's like, I know, I know. And Read further. And because, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm like the rest of the Internet. I read the first paragraph and was like, hot dog. Yeah, what a weird a choice of lenses they've uh, they've chosen. You were for burned. This. You were burned. I got burned yeah. hard. Yeah. So, so basically they're doing like uh, a, it will shoot like actually fire the electronic shutter at 120 frames per second. But just with focus locked like AFS or manual mm -hmm. focus, you're not getting Sony's real time tracking. Um, with these still still you're capped on their fast bodies at 15 frames per second if you want tracking and i do want to point this out because I, I see this so much on social the thing that you say i should stay off of chris but i see a lot yes. of on social media people that blame the lens makers for anything that mm. they've seen is like you know deficient like why isn't nikon right. you know why isn't sigma releasing lens for for canon and nikon or whatever and then in this case they'd be like why is sigma like hampering their lenses why can't they get their act together uh this yep. is not sigma right this is this is definitely not sigma sony yeah, yeah. and I, I mean it is frustrating for us because we do test out they've got nice fast linear motors on a lot of those sigma lenses now we test them and we couldn't see a difference even shooting 120 frame per second video doing a quick focus yeah. pull uh so we're shooting 120 frames and it's keeping up on the sigma yeah that's, it's yeah. capable of doing it that's so, the sony reason just, sony doesn't yeah, want you I know. to <laughs> they, <laughs> And I mean, Sony support will work on even their older lenses, right? I mean, across the board, across their motors. So uh, in a lot of cases. So yeah, it's it's funny. They chose 15 frames per second. It almost seems like an arbitrary number. Um, just high enough to still showcase the capabilities of their bodies without giving the third-party manufacturers too big an advantage. But yeah, it is silly. Um the, this firmware update, I mean, what does it really change? I think the lenses are always capable of shooting at those modes. So Yeah, absolutely. It's just actually going to let you shoot 120 frames yeah. per second with those lenses attached yeah, now. But, you know, with like locked focus, it's not that useful. Yeah, I don't yeah know it's great if you're shooting good. like a batter, you know, in baseball. Or even something then. Something. Yeah. Even it's still then. nice to Because what if they hit the ball and they start running, right? You know, you want to capture that sequence. So yeah. I got baseball well, on the mind because I, I shot baseball. Quicker that than was, you've ever done before. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like old timey yeah. times. <laughs> it's funny that you say that uh, because I told Jordan that I'm on the IL today and Jordan's like, what's an ill? And I'm like, it's like, the injured list. It's a baseball reference. And he's like, I assumed oh, it was, I was a Beastie Boys reference. Was. Yeah, I had no idea. <laughs> uh, before we move on to uh, the other stories today, I want to mention the lenses that are capable of this now. It's Sigma's 14 to 24 f 2.8, the 50 millimeter 1.4, the 105 f 2.8, the 28 to 70 f 2.8, the 60 to 600 4.5 to 6.3, the 100 to 400 five to six three the 150 to 600 five to six three the 35 one four chris's favorite the 85 one four and the 500 five six oh, which that 500 five six is it well, would be great so, if that supported yeah. full-time autofocus yeah. at 120 you could do some crazy totally. stuff with that lens but oh well I mean, I, I think we'll we just see. have to keep putting pressure on the manufacturers, you know. To Maybe someone will hack the firmware. Someone can hack Sony's firmware. Let's let's make a let's make a magic lantern for. Yeah, Sony what's Magic AI? Lantern guy doing anyways? Come yeah. on, buddy. Like, yeah, magic this lantern. Get us some magic light <laughs> and make this uh, all work. Third party support un unlocked. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, let's talk about our friend Hugh Brownstone for a minute. Hugh, oh, he's my friend. Yeah, he's a good guy. Three Blind Men and an Elephant YouTube channel. He uh, has been working with three an architect. Mice, what? Three Blind <laughs> Is it Three is Blind it mice? mice? Is it Three Blind Men? Three no. blind is it men. mice? Uh, it's, I, it's Men and an Elephant, I'm pretty sure. It's Men and an Elephant. Three Blind Men. Yeah, there we go. Don't make me feel like we made a, a copy error in the body no, here. You did right. You did okay. right. I was just, I love kids' nursery rhymes. Anyways. I think it's a play on that. Not exactly the same. And I'm at sure any rate. It is. 
Uh, it's called the level. HE three hand grip for the Leica Q three. He helium. Made it in, yes, he made it in conjunction with a architect friend of his, and they've been working on it for a year. Um, the reason they decided to do this was because Leica's official Q three grip has several limitations that they don't like. And then all of the other third party grips on the market did either if they improved those limitations, they were deficient in other areas. So what they did is they created a grip that has that won't block the battery and memory card slots or prevent use of the camera's hot shoe. It works with Leica's Ooh. finger loop. It stores an Apple AirTag, and I cannot for the life of me figure out where it goes in here. And they act and Hugh actually says they're working on a patent still like it's, it's in process. So he wouldn't tell us how they did it. Um, but that's neat. It has a bottom anchor lug for different strap configurations is peak design compatible and has a built in Arca Swiss tripod mount. Also, yeah. all of these, the, the grip is hard to remove. If you like say this camera is stolen from you, mm. the grip is hard to remove, making it hard to access the Apple AirTag too. So right. like you should be able to keep tracking it for a period of time. Uh, the Very grip cool. itself was currently available for pre-order. And he is, I think, charging that was like 600 bucks for it. No. Yeah. OK. The helium grip is available for pre-order now for four hundred and eighty dollars. And the reason that, that sounds expensive, but so if you Q3. were to, if you yeah, well, it's a Leica product. So, yeah. But also, if you were to try and get the wireless charging version of the official Leica grip for yeah. the Q3, it's more than this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this is so full featured. I mean, also, I think it's important to point out the way they they've are um, designed this you know, very svelte, very like sort of elegant design. It does give you the thumb rest included, right? So you don't have to buy a separate thumb rest and a separate grip. It's all in you know, incorporated into the helium. And, you know, like what's cool about Hugh, first off, he's a fantastic street photographer. He shoots lots of Leicas. So you know that it's coming from a position of somebody who's used this, has seen the deficiencies in the products that are out there, tested on a regular basis. And so, you know, that's really inspiration is I'm sure he was like, this is what I need. This is what works best. And it's cool that, you know, like any YouTuber where we always complain like, oh, they left this out. They left that out. He's made a product where they really haven't left anything out. It covers yeah. all your bases, does everything. So, so now I just need a Q3. And then, yeah. I, then I know where to reach out to for the grip. So let's get on that yeah. Q3 thing. I want a Q3. Like it mates to the body really beautifully. Like it wraps yeah, it looks around great. the Q3 body beautifully. It looks great. Yeah. Great and understated. And yeah, so I, I really, uh, I think if you guys have Q3s out there, definitely take a look at this product. Give it a try. Um, but yeah, congrats to our friend Hugh for making a product like this. Very cool. I think it's nice that... He managed like folks are going to, of course, there will be someone who will complain that this is too expensive, but like, mm -hmm. I think folks don't really understand how expensive it is to make something like this. I can't imagine mm -hmm. that he is <laughs> actually going to make money on this unless he sells a ton of them. I think he cares. It's just a passion project of doing something yeah, right. Yeah. Cause like just dead. Yeah. imagine spending a year's worth of time building something like how much is that worth a lot? And yeah. I just you have to sell a lot of these to make that up, which is probably why a lot of companies don't invest this kind of time and effort into a product is because it doesn't make sense from a profit margin perspective. Yeah. And if you check out the article on Petapixel about this, what's really cool is you get to see a lot of the process of like what they were thinking about, what they were trying to do, the 3D models, the prototypes, the build design. So, you know, it kind of goes through some of the backstory. And if you support them on this and, and you know, they, they find it worthwhile, then maybe we'll see new grips for M11s as well. That would be nice, too. So he would be yeah. very smart to do an X100 one right now. X100, would, would sure. Be, the integration of, of an AirTag. I think is a really smart idea because clearly yeah, no yeah. camera company is going to is putting any effort into making their cameras like any type of theft resistant. Yeah. So having at least some way to track it. Great. Yeah. Congrats to you. Yeah. This isn't an ad too. We should no, mention. He didn't we just thought this was no. cool. Yeah. He's just, just a good friend of ours. And, and like I say, he really knows like and he shoots all the time in these demanding situations. So he, he's an expert on what is required. Yeah. yeah. Check out his uh, Instagram and Claudia, his wife, as well. Um, they're both fantastic photographers. Yeah, beautiful photography. Well, speaking of Leica, let's talk about the first underwater housing <laughs> ever made for the Leica M6. It's made by Sub13, a company that also makes an underwater housing for the Q3 and the M series, digital M series. Uh, they are yeah. making an extremely limited run, like extremely limited, uh, like under 20 per M series, M6 wow. series. Uh, and it is probably this company makes probably the most 
beautiful underwater housings They're I've gorgeous. ever seen for any camera. They look spectacular. Uh, but yeah, this thing is a, it's like seven thousand dollars, something like that. And it's uh, yeah. made for a very specific type of film photographer. I love the little magnifying glass so you can see how many shots you still have left yeah. on your roll. Uh, it's just a bunch of cool stuff that is clearly they didn't just take one of their like digital M's and be like, oh, and it'll kind of fit an uh, M6 as well. Like it's got the little winder attachment so you can still do that. Check your film, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the issue is just, yay, this is still a rangefinder. Uh, so you're basically <laughs> hyper focal focusing underwater. Yeah. I mean, there's clearly people more talented than me out there. So good on all. Yeah. Uh, I'll well, it has, you. <laughs> but you have it has a viewfinder spot. You can put your eye up to it underwater if you wanted. Um, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. it's got a viewfinder spot. I mean, the logistics to to seal like the thumb winder so that it actually still articulates fully underwater and stuff like very very cool. It's cool. Yeah, but so, you know, this is a different product from what we just talked about. Insofar as like these are very expensive, and I mean, it's it's so funny. Like kudos to Sub Thirteen for making these. It seems like a very limited market. It seems like, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm ignorant, but how many people are actually taking their Leica gear underwater to shoot? Um, 26. Dozens. There are dozens of us. Dozens. <laughs> yeah. Dozens, right? It's not a lot because they're only making 13 M6 TTL housings and 13 standard M6 housings. So it's it's not a lot. Um I mean, but, you'd want the flash anyways. Like, oh man! It just, well, there are some pictures on their website that show what someone has already done with their their first prototype of this. Uh, yeah. They're pretty pictures. Sure, I can't can't deny that. Um, it just it does feel like a solution looking for a problem. But you know, for the, I think someone asked them for it. Some like two very yeah. specific people are like, "Hey, can you make us one for the M6?" And yeah. they're like, "I guess well, we they, could. we've got the design, so I guess let's make a few more of them." Yeah, there you yeah. go. Analog knows no bounds now. Look at that. So, yeah. Oh, um, is that a segue? Is it? Yes, because the next story <laughs> <laughs> is uh, we're gonna we're gonna basically give a kudos to Harman. Harman Technologies committed a what they're describing as a multi million pound, this is British pound sterling, not like a pound is in the United States weight investment into film manufacturing capabilities, and says it is now one of the largest, if not the largest, most active right. film production, research, and development business on the planet. What they did is they purchased new equipment that allows them to produce more film. And they're saying the last time any company invested in equipment like this at this scale was in the 1990s. Wow. So yeah. they really are saying, we understand that analog is important. We're going to keep making it. And to keep making it, we're going to invest in it. And so as I understand it, for those that might not, like Harman was one of the main companies behind sort of keeping Ilford going, right? The Ilford film stocks going. Um, they make a lot of paper stocks themselves. I believe they do release films under their own name as well. Um, but I believe that they have um, a stake at least in Ilford and the manufacturing of Ilford. So yeah, this is, uh, this is cool. I mean, it, it certainly shows that there's a market there, there's demand for it. And, you know, it's, it's interesting, Jordan, Jordan and I were just at Folk Fest shooting and I met this uh, lovely photographer named Annie and they're shooting there with like all this analog equipment, like a uh, uh, super eight camera, yeah. um, film camera. And I'm like, yeah, doing black and white, developing their own black and white. And it's like, okay, that's really cool that people are still using that for creative projects and, and desiring that particular look. So yeah, it was just, uh, I mean, I knew that it was already there, but of course, just to see it in action. And it wasn't just, you know, that person. There's a lot of people shooting uh, analog there at that event. I so. walked right in front of someone who was shooting on 16 mil at Folk mm -hmm. Fest, and, which means I probably ruined that cost, you know, them like $17 when I walked through in the back of yeah, their shot unaware. Frames, yeah. But uh, man, that was cool to see. So <laughs> yeah, it, it was really interesting because that's so much of our, like, our crowd. Kind of, you know, the people who are really creative and into this kind of stuff to see what's exciting them right now. And it was a lot of analog, uh, a lot yeah, of DSLRs, too. a lot of old DSLRs. Like it's like it's like a lot of the young photographers purposely want to use the old school stuff. And and it's it, it's clearly not a cost thing because analog is like the most expensive thing in the planet. It's clearly like a desire to have the experience that we kind of all took for granted. And I feel like now as an old man, I'm I'm like. I would almost never want to go back to that stuff. Obviously I have fun when we do it on the YouTube show, but 
in practice, no, you, like yeah, I, I don't want to do it. <laughs> I mean, we're going to do it on my regular time off. Like I, I want the convenience of a mirrorless, the better autofocus, the ease of use, you know, the stress-free kind of nature of it. But good on, uh, good on this young batch of photographers actually shooting analog beyond just like a like a fanciful kind of experience, nostalgic experience. Like they actually are they using were taking it, it serious. as a creative yeah. tool. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That was also now we know why Fuji's um, really rolling in money right now. Having walked around yeah. Folk Fest as like, man, oh, they own excellent. like if it isn't a mirrorless camera, it seems to be a Fuji film, which was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I can also speak to like, we're going to talk about it next week on the podcast. There's going to be some film talk, uh, but I can say. Uh, I've been shooting some Super 8, and it's been a lot of fun, and I'd sure like to get my film back. So uh, we'll <laughs> talk about we'll, that next week. If we'll have it fun. in time for that episode, so you could actually Very say Very expensive. Yes. We're never going to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Let's final story of the week is that Pentax is supporting the K1 and K1 Mark II, both of them, with a new firmware update only in Japan right now. Uh, it is planned to come to other regions eventually, but we don't know when. Uh, it is an astrophotography assistant that adds three features. Uh, star AF, which is not the same as Starry st Sky AF, uh, oh, remote control, fi focus, fine adjustment, and astronomical image processing into mm -hmm. the camera. Uh, yeah, astrophotography related. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, is, it's it's good that they're still supporting these old SLRs. I mean, people are still using the Well, that's still their current form. lineup. <laughs> yeah I, I know the I'd original k1 though that's i, I kind of have to be like that is, okay yeah that's, that's pretty nice impressive of you you yeah. didn't have to support yeah. the original k1 and you still are i mean Although the k1 fair, mark ii is the, the same camera yeah there's <laughs> no difference. come on i mean these are old cameras i will stick by it like you know yeah. not just design but they've been around a long time still excellent image quality you know they already have some benefits for astrophotography but this is nice i mean it's nice to see them doing some live view improvements because Focusing with a EVF, oh sorry, with an OVF, you know, classic style is difficult to get mm -hmm. accurate. Yeah, for so us um, the Star Autofocus is basically exactly the same as Olympus uh, OM Systems Starry Sky AF. Yeah, uh, just focuses back and forth until that dot is as small as possible. Yeah. Then you know you've nailed focus. It should be built into every camera. I don't know if it was a patent issue, but that's why it's surprising to see it on a Rico body at this point. Yeah. Uh, but it is yeah. extremely useful. So what is interesting too, I mean, so the remote control fine focus is just, you can actually focus the camera using the little remote so that you don't actually physically touch the camera. This is important if you don't want to like mess up your composition in any way, or, you know, uh, you want to have really fine control over the focus that you might not be able to do with cold fingers in the middle of the night in the dark. Um, astronomical image processing. So this is in camera uh, image processing. So that is maybe the most interesting is that, and, and that's the one I really kind of want to test out and see this ability to uh, process either RAWs or JPEGs um, and, and be able to do a lot of the processing that we would normally do after the fact. Yeah, yeah, you generally sorry. process astro photos very different from any other type yeah. of exposure. So it's great to have that uh, built in and their samples look great. And yeah, I, of course, I'm going to still take my raw files home and really develop them. But when I'm in the field, if I'm sitting out there in the middle of the night, that's great. I can take a photo and see like, oh, yeah, this gives me a much better idea of what it's eventually going to look like once I'm done processing. Did I get the shot? Uh, things like that, especially things like reducing uh, the light pollution just lets me know, like, did I actually capture the sky or is it just light bleeding up from the ground? So I, I do think this is really useful. Uh, and yeah, big kudos to them. Um, but it's I'd paid. love to see it over here. Yeah, it is paid. paid. So I got a question, Jordan. Yeah. You, you should remember this. How much was the uh, Panasonic V-Log? upgrade way back when oh, oh i want to say a hundred because it was over a hundred canadian i believe it was 140 so i'm going to say a hundred dollars yeah. okay so this isn't crazy they're looking for eleven thousand yen for this which is about 70 us dollars right now on the conversion so it's expensive but it's not the craziest expensive i guess as far as firmware updates yeah. go but it makes sense, like, because it's it's one of these things that n not very many people are going to use it. Mm -hmm. um, I think any serious astrophotographers, well, they might, they, for them, it's like, what's 70 bucks, right? Like, let's do it. But, you know, they already have a process and a workflow that works for them. So I don't, I don't expect that there's a huge audience for this. So if you need to recoup some research costs, I get it. That's exactly it. Like, I'm happy to subsidize firmware 
research and development. If it means we get cool stuff like this, you know, it doesn't come out of nowhere, it costs money to develop, then yeah, if we find it useful, I'm okay to throw a little bit, like $70 I think is quite reasonable. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that none of the other full frame manufacturers are really tackling this kind of photography. Um, I mean, obviously, people are using the cameras like Sony's, Nikon's, Canon's for astrophotography, but that there isn't a lot of assist tools development for those companies. Pentax has always been loyal to that. You know, OM System and Olympus, they they certainly have that as well. And so, and they're nice tools to use. We've used them. We've tested them. Yep. They work great. Like they really do simplify the process. So, um. You know, yeah, at the same time, if you're using manual focus glass and stuff like that, you know, old Rokinons and things like that, this isn't really going to help you out that much. But yeah, interesting. All right. Let's talk about Nikon. Is there something going on with that sensor on the Z6 III? There's, uh, oh. we got, we got a couple of things that we're going to discuss about it. Let's, <laughs> Jordan's going to get into the flickering, which is uh, a story that we don't really have much update on. And then I kind of want to ask you guys your thoughts on the sensor in general. So let's start with the flickering. Can For anyone who doesn't know, what's happening? Okay, so what is happening in video mode? Um, this was initially uh, discovered at extremely high ISOs shooting raw video. Is I mean, we're used to seeing a ton of noise. Like these are the kind of exposures, yep. 51,200 shooting raw video. <laughs> I mean, people generally are not going to do that kind of thing. But if you did it, as opposed to just a consistent noise pattern, you would actually see exposure flickering, getting brighter and darker, big portions of the shadow information on that. Um, which, I mean, certainly if you're shooting at these ISOs uh, and you're not you know, bringing down your exposure to kind of eliminate those deepest shadow areas, it's very distracting. It doesn't look good. Um, some people have compared it to like, oh, it just kind of looks like the flicker of an old movie camera. It really doesn't because it's only impacting a specific portion of the image. Right. Uh, so I did some testing with it because initially what we saw was um, NRAW at those extreme high ISOs. This does still impact ProRes RAW as well you shoot that at extremely high ISOs. Um, and it is even a little bit visible if you shoot H.265. Um, so right. that 10-bit. Like The thing to remember is your ProRes RAW, your NRAW, there is no noise reduction applied to that. It is a RAW image. It's what's coming right off the sensor. Um, so that's why that is quite a bit more pronounced. Your H.265 is applying some noise reduction, which I think is just basically killing that channel for the most part, which is why it's a lot less obvious. Um, so I was wondering, is this just an extreme high ISOs? Uh, scaled it down to that camera's second base ISO is 6400 in video mode. Um, and once we knocked it back down there, you can see in the very deepest shadow layers, again, there is still a bit of that flickering effect. So, I mean, the, it is there. We've confirmed it's there. So the next obvious question is like, what is this actually going to impact? Um, and that's a tougher question because I am always of the mindset that like, in extreme low light situations, I'm not generally that worried about contrast. Like it's not often I'm extremely low light and I've got a lot of bright and dark information that I need access to. Right. So typically I'm not shooting log in those situations. Um, and there, if you use a standard profile, you'll never see this issue. Um, but if you do want the absolute most flexibility or like, you know, your editor is like, nope, we need raw video for this and you're going to shoot an extreme low light this can be a concern for you and it might make you hesitate about buying the camera. How many people that actually applies to is not a lot to be totally right. honest. And that's why, you know, in the video I was like, I don't want to dedicate a ton of time to this. And it's just in terms of like the amount we're going to spend on the review to how many people it's actually going to impact. So I want people to be aware of it, but just know if you're not shooting a ton of extreme low light and pushing the shadows, it's not really right. going to be a factor for you. Like practically we've shot in a lot of different lighting situations. Uh, like we were shooting pretty dark actually the other day, Chris and I were shooting the roots yep. at night and that's huge contrast at night on a stage. Uh, the flickering was not an issue in that situation. So can I clarify Jordan? Like, yeah. um, so yeah, it'll work in, in either compressed formats or raw formats when shooting log. So, uh, if you're shooting like a Rec. 7 and 9 profile, that disappears completely. I didn't see it. Yeah, uh, even yeah, okay. cranking that ISO way up there. So using right, like right, right. I do like Nikon's flat profile. If you don't want to do a ton of grading, there I didn't see the issue even at fifty one thousand two hundred yeah. ISO. And then if you did have this flickering, 
it would be a real pain in the ass to fix in post. So there are some people online, like in the DP review forums, I saw Horseshack, who's a really technical user, uh, pops up out there all the time, uh, was saying that there is a deflicker uh, tool in DaVinci Resolve that does work with this. Uh, uh, and that okay. actually makes a ton of sense because Resolve is currently the only thing that can process the NRAW, um, like as a mainstream editing program. So right, you right. do have a solution for that. Um, obviously, you'll lose information once you put that on. But again, those shadows are so noisy at that point. It's basically just to give your image some consistency as opposed yeah. to actually recover detail in that deepest shadow. So th there are some workarounds. If you're shooting ProRes RAW, it it's still early days. We're waiting to hear. And I mean, that's the big question that you brought up right at the top of this, Jaren, is, is this an issue with like the processing because it's a brand new sensor or is it a limitation to a partially stacked sensor. And we can't compare it to anything else because this is the only partially stacked sensor on the market. <laughs> yeah, in your, in your opinion, like what would cause this? So I, I know it is, yeah, we're in those extreme noisy areas where you'll see like an irregular pattern of color. Uh, like you can just pull up an RGB parade uh, and you'll see that shimmering in all your different color channels in the deepest shadows. Um, and for some reason, it's like maybe the amplification at that deepest channel is what's like curving up and down um, hmm. through it. But I don't know if it's a power issue, a sensor issue. Again, I've never encountered this before. So it's tough for me to say what I think is causing it. Um, you know, I, I haven't had to deal with it before. Uh, and if anyone's curious, we have made Nikon aware and we're awaiting their response. Uh, we have not heard back from them since we reported this. Yeah. Uh, of note, a lot of Nikon in Japan was on vacation last week, which is when we reported it to them. So I'm assuming that they got back this week and are like, we need well, to I'm test sure this on. ourselves and figure yeah. out what's going on before that they can even issue a statement. But then again, that's just me speculating. Yeah. Chris, did you want to speak to the photographic deal yeah. on the partially stacked yeah. sensor? So yeah, this is interesting. I mean, the partially stacked sensor, the, you know, to give the context, we had a great time in Portland. We got to see our friend Jaren. We got to play with the Z6 III pre-production. And so, you know, the context there is that playing with the camera where you cannot test raw files and you cannot test dynamic range, right? We can't do that with initial impressions because we don't have full support and they're not final cameras. So then you look at the Z6 III and it's like everything about it is great. Otherwise, it handles beautifully. It's a great compact weight. Uh, the EVF is better than what you get in the Z8, Z9. Like it's a really nice camera and it handles well. You know, the focusing is the latest that Nikon offers. And then you get to play with this partially stacked sensor and on paper, it really makes a lot of sense. It gives you um, a compromise between getting faster burst rates without having to pay the price of a fully stacked sensor. And yeah. so that makes a lot of sense. It keeps the camera a little bit more affordable, makes it a versatile price point, more of a workhorse for more people. Um, and, you know, the images are nice. Like, there's no problem there. I mean, I like the images I got, 24 megapixels. That's all par for the course at that price range. And so we're playing with it and and everything about it's so awesome. And so then when we get a final camera, we start to really see it. And, you you know, other people in the community are testing, like Bill Claff at Photons to Photos. He always does a great job of really testing these cameras and seeing what what's behind the the, yeah. the veil, so to speak. Now we start to notice some interesting things about this partially stacked sensor. We assumed that if you're going to have a compromise where you get faster burst rates without too much money, um, you'll also have compromises to things like, well, when we go to partially stacked sensors shooting electronic shutters, or, or not, not partially stacked, but fully stacked sensors, but yep. shooting electronic shutter mode, you often see a DR hit on a yep. lot of cameras. There is a penalty consistently with every yep. sta fully stacked sensor that we've seen. Yeah, absolutely. And so this penalty, you know, yeah, we accept it. You say, okay, well, if you don't want the penalty, shoot mechanical shutter mode. And if you're willing to accept it, you go to electronic shutter mode, then you get faster burst rates. So we figured it'd be a similar story here. But what's really interesting about the Z6 III sensor is that's not the case. So the first thing that was interesting, the dynamic range is the same whether you shoot electronic shutter or mechanical shutter on this camera. And that's, that's not unheard of, but it's odd. It's rare. And, um, the cameras, you know, just to give context, is shooting the same bit depth on files, whether you shoot mechanical or electronic yeah, shutters. Still so that makes bit. sense. Um, but at the same time, it really kind of puts you in this position of like, well, okay, I'm not getting a benefit going to mechanical shutter other than I won't get rolling shutter issues. That's that's really the only reason. Otherwise, electronic shutter gives you faster burst rates um, and we're not getting a DR hit. Okay, sounds great. No, so far, no big deal. But then what we noticed is there's globally quite a large DR hit 
across this camera. And, you know, you compare it to something like the older sensor in the Z6 II, which is also 24 megapixels, not stacked you'll actually be losing about a stop of dynamic range in yeah. comparison all the time. You don't have the option to go to a mechanical shutter. And when we look at it, you know, compared to cameras like the R6 Mark II from Canon or the Sony a7 IV, those cameras have comparably low DR uh, when shooting electronic shutter mode. Well, sorry, the R6 II does. Yeah, the R6 II does. The Sony's even still a little bit better. But um, the R6 II is actually worse. But they have the option of then going to mechanical shutter to get that DR back, and the Z6 III does not. And so that, that's interesting. It's kind of like you're, you're going to take this hit no matter what. The DR is still good. I mean, we're still getting good dynamic range. How, how this is going to impact you as a photographer really depends on what kind of photography you do. If you really want to shoot high contrast scenes, uh, you know, you really want to push shadows, that's where if you're shooting low light situations at low ISOs, we'll talk about that. That's where this is going to be a bit of a penalty, right? I think a lot of photographers are going to use the Z6 III, probably not even notice the DR hit, not even care. Um, but if you are really concerned with dynamic range, you are taking a hit here. And I should point out, this is only happening at ISOs below 800. Yes, so that's we're key. talking about your lower ISOs. Yeah, right. as soon as you hit 800 in that second gain step, it's identical performance. It's comparable everybody. to everybody. And if you were so, if you're shooting like weddings in low light with fast shutter speeds, you're cranking your ISO up. If you're shooting concerts where you need fast shutter speeds, you're cranking your ISO up. The Z6 III is not going to penalize you at all. It's really just going to be those situations where you shoot lower ISOs uh, and you're trying to get maximum dynamic range. I mean, yeah, a stop below its predecessor, that's, that's a big hit. No yeah, doubt. There's it's no it's identical to an APS-C camera, to the Z50. Yeah. I pulled up Bill Claff's charts in our full review. You're and basically it's the same getting APS-C dynamic range. Yeah. This yeah. has me thinking. Um, we talked to... And we don't Can know why. Yeah. Right. So two things. We've asked Nikon since we saw this camera, hey, this is back in Portland because before mm -hmm. it was announced, can you send us some information on what what is this partially... Give us some details on the sensor. We're curious. Like it's construction. Like can your engineers talk about it? Haven't heard anything, and I know we've they've yeah. <laughs> it's been requested like from Nikon USA. They've asked, and we haven't got any information back, which is weird. Usually, you would think for something that's not existing on the market at all, brand new technology, they'd want to like you know yeah. honk the horn I a mean, little bit, but yeah. but they haven't. So that's not necessarily saying anything. It's just I thought it was strange. Uh, but one more thing I wanted to ask you guys that I didn't even put on our list. It just came to me uh, when we were in Arizona. Canon said that the R1 does not have a DR hit between shutter and electronic. And I can't remember if they said the same for R5 too, um, but I'm positive they said it about R1. Yeah, the R1. Because yeah. the bit so, depth's the same, they're saying. Yeah, well, yeah, they, they specifically, them specifically yeah. did yeah. we hit a dynamic range hit and they said no, not and yeah. no, <laughs> comma, the bit depth is the same is what they said. So they answered yeah. the question and then added to it. Mm -hmm, of right. course, we'll find out eventually. But it depends which of the seventeen spec sheets they were reading off of uh, for the <laughs> R1 launch. Would you be I mean, surprised look. if the R1 actually had no dynamic range hit between the two, shutter and electronic? Because the electronic, they, they're they're claiming some really good low low light performance on this thing. Yeah. I mean, I think you know we have a tech support question that we're gonna. This is kind of maybe we're already answering it, but. I mean, traditionally, like technology is getting better and better and sensor tech is getting better. And we might see a time now where we don't have DR differences, um, you know, but classically, and you see this on the R6 Mark II from Canon, this is a good example where when you go to electronic shutter mode, you're, you're getting the silent shooting, you're getting the faster burst rates. That's really the marketing push, right? They're trying to get fast burst rates for sports and action photographers who might not necessarily run into rolling shutter issues. They may or they may not, um, but they'll, they're willing to sacrifice some image quality to get that. And one of the ways they do that is by dropping the bit depth of the file when they're shooting electronic shutter mode. And then you do lose some DR by doing that, but you're trading off for the faster burst rates. So maybe we're now getting to a point where the sensors are reading out fast enough, the processors are capable that we don't necessarily have to drop bit depth going down to electronic shutter mode, which is a great thing. But it's interesting on the Z6 III where 
we didn't necessarily see a a boost with electronic shutter. We actually saw a degradation with mechanical shutter, if you want to look at it that way, because we're not getting any benefit yeah. going okay. back up to the mechanical. Well, I, I mean both, because it's outperforming a camera like a you know Panasonic S5 II or the Canon R6 we mentioned that's dropping right. down to 12 bit when it's shooting electronic shutter mode. This is still outperforming those. I mean that's mm-hmm. Jeremy wrote an article basically saying like this is the most usable electronic shutter in its price class, and, which it absolutely is at that 14 bit readout. Um, but yes, it does seem to be impacting the mechanical on that. The other thing I'm really yeah. curious about, and we didn't talk about this in the video because it's just getting into the weeds a little bit. If you look on photons to photos, Bill Klaus site that everybody's using to check photographic DR, if you see triangles on that graph, that means it's applying noise reduction to the raw files, uh, which is going to give you the look of more DR because there's less noise in it, but you're actually throwing away shadow right. detail by doing it. And I'm very curious if we're going to see that on the um, on the R1 and the R5 too as well, because uh, we've seen it on most of the recent Canon. Canon cameras. traditionally bake noise reduction into the files. And, and, and I can't, look, I can't say anything just from... Uh, looking at the pictures, uh, you know, like pixel peep in the pictures, but I'm going to go ahead and say it anyways. To my eye, I feel like there was still noise reduction being applied. I, I, um, yeah. It looks, it, it, I just, yeah, you know, I get a feeling. You've been doing this for a while. Yeah. Chill in my spine. If you're, I'm like, ah, if you're like only listening to this and the, the, Chris's facial expressions are fantastic for this. Hey, yeah, that noise reduction, sir. <laughs> uh, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah. So okay. very curious, very interesting. And, and you know, the, the, the point to make about the Z6 III, as you say, like the electronic shutter is definitely reading out faster than the Canon and the Sony compares, like comparative cameras. So yeah, we're getting less rolling shutter. It's a very usable electronic shutter. Um, so yeah, it's just it's just interesting that we don't get any benefit going to mechanical, but that still means that it's a viable camera, very versatile, um, decent price. You know, like it's not bad. And uh, yeah, at the same time, and I wrote this in my article. If anybody wants to read it, it does still kind of though feel like the Z 63 is very refined, but it didn't like leap head and shoulders above everybody else as far as sensor tech goes with this new push. So I feel like, you know, the a7 IV is getting a little older. Maybe there's going to be a replacement. I don't know if Canon's going to replace the Z6 II anytime soon, or the R6 II anytime soon. But, you don't uh, think so? I mean, I, I feel like we'll get an a7 V by next year. A7 V for sure, yeah. And, and, and so I guess what I'm saying is there's room for, especially Sony, to then maybe just like... Right. Sh- but you're saying you don't expect like anything do from R6 II for a while next year? I don't know. I don't know. So, so my issue, because I was just cutting this video, is how much time to give to issues that aren't going to have a huge impact on a lot of people. Because I just keep going back to the fact that like, if I had $2,500 and I wanted a hybrid camera, I would buy a Z6 III. Abs- like, yeah. uh, no question. Absolutely. Uh, There's a reason yeah, at the end of the should... review, it's a recommended buy. Because Absolutely, it's good. yeah. But you it's... just had to be clear there are some limitations the, that yeah, weren't people, obvious. Yeah, people need initially. to know. If you're, if you're the kind of person who likes to shoot landscapes and really push shadows, or you're shooting extreme low light video, you need to be aware of that. But that's not a lot of people. Um, and yeah. for everyone and we else, point like, out this George, is, like, I had so much fun at Folk Fest with this camera, taking did. pictures and recording video. It was fantastic. Uh, that but was price. that the camera or was that the roots? Okay, the roots were that's one yeah. of the best live that's shows. That's the third time now I've life. seen pure joy on your face. Three I times was euphoric. In your life. Euphoric. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh it, I, we should point out like the Z63 is proving to be like uh, the best video shooting camera of these that we're talking about, right? You need to look at the contemporary cameras. I mean, the S5 II, also very good video. Yeah. How would you compare that? Just quickly, Jordan, I know it's off topic. No, I, I, I think that's three. totally fair. So the S5 II, I mean, definitely still has some better assist tools. The open gate recording, I love and use all the time. Yeah. Um, but as an overall package, like having oversampled 4k 60 without having to crop and getting incredible detail on that i think uh and having 4k 120 support on it the ability to shoot raw if i want to like nikon is just that sensor is making a lot of stuff capable that the panasonic can't do it's held back by its sensor um where the nikon i think is held back a little bit by its interface is still not quite as video optimized as what panasonic's doing but the sensor is better for video and i really hope we're about to see an s2h with that you know, even though we complained about DR, but get that same <laughs> 24 megapixel partially stacked sensor on an S2H so body, it would be another trade off in favor of video at yeah. the expense of photography. Typical. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Typical. <laughs> okay. What is this world coming to? 
Yeah, you sound like the uh, the comment section of the website. They want <laughs> they just want a camera that takes only pictures. Nobody shoots video. Yeah. Uh, all right. What have we been up to? Uh, you hinted at it earlier. I'll start because I'm grievously wounded. Uh, I'm holding <laughs> it up now for anyone else to see it. I cut myself pretty badly yesterday. Uh, Yikes. Trying to make some food. Uh, I won't go into details of how and the exact injury, but uh, I was Because they'll not- criticize your form and technique if you do. So let's just <laughs> yeah. say it was unavoidable. There was no <laughs> what way. What knife was it? What? What knife was it? Uh, it was one of the knives that I bought at the Japanese garden, actually, that's imported from like a specialty knife maker in Japan that they partner. They, oh, they rotate through specialty knife makers uh, at the, the, sh- the gift shop at the Japanese garden, which Chris loves in Portland. Yeah. And this is one of the things. So she like was high carbon too. steel and sharp is what you're it telling me. It was sharp as all get out. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's why the wound is so severe is because I put a, anyway, at any rate, I'm hurt. Uh, I, I sh- but I'm fine though. I can, I still have my editing hand, which is my right hand. I so want more details. Did you lose any part of your thumb? Yes. Yikes. Ooh. Do you have Yakuza affiliations? No. <laughs> okay, because it's the wrong finger. Okay, uh, let's just, just say just it was. If anyone's curious, did I get sk- stitches? No, there was nothing to stitch. Oof. Oh my god! Right. Um, so, how, so this will be an ongoing saga. Is we'll, every week we'll just reveal a little bit more of what Jaron's <laughs> hand is eventually going to look like. Yeah, because well, I don't we even hope you get look better. at it right now. I'm I'm kind of glad yeah, it's we covered hope you get up. Better. Uh, what have you guys been doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going on vacation has- next week, right? I- yeah, it hasn't been a very exciting week. Uh, I went fishing with my middle child. That was fun uh, up in Kananaskis, and we got to sight fish for brown trout. He's like, this is like my, like, he's kind of interested in fishing now and being outdoors. And that was like my dream. And I was, I already wrote off like, oh, my kids aren't going to fish with me. It's never going to happen. But now he's like, I enjoy it. And I'm like, I'm just trying to hold on to that uh, for as long as I can. Cause if it goes away, I will. I will shatter. I will shatter like a piece of glass in my soul. My heart will break. So I'm just hoping for that. So I'm in a very tenuous emotional situation right Great. now. <laughs> you know, very so you were tenuous. filled with tons of joy and you're scared that it will be taken from you. Yes, exactly. I know now what true loss could feel like. So... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but no, it's great. I just don't want to go through it again because I already went through it and I was like, oh, please don't just be teasing me because kids are fickle. They're yeah, they fickle, yeah. right? Yeah. He's 16, 16 year olds are fickle. So hopefully it'll, it'll, you know, pun intended, hook him and we'll see what happens. But we had a great time. Otherwise, I haven't cut myself with a knife in decades. It's really weird. So I'm uh, happy. <laughs> You've cut that. your, I've seen your thumbs. You cut them with other things. Well, they're rough as hell because I'm like an outdoorsy dude, and I yeah. fish and I you know, like yeah. dry and cracked yeah. and whatever. But yeah, but I, I haven't I haven't cut myself with a knife. I did stab my my webbing here with the knife last night, but it didn't cut. It was so I'm, you know, you're just too okay. powerful. Knife couldn't break. And that through. was with my Japanese gyuto, and it just yeah, it was it was okay. It was okay. Uh, I got away with it. Oh but, man, I had a week. I mean, you said Chris, we didn't do much, but Folk Fest was fantastic. We that's did true, shoot folk, some, I didn't want to take some that stuff for that. Me. Yeah, um, and we we're lucky. This is the first year I've had actual press access. We've shot lots of episodes there over the years. It's yeah. probably Calgary's best uh, music festival. But yeah, we had press access to go shoot the first three songs of the Roots, which they don't actually. They're famous for like they don't stop. They segue from one song into a new one the entire concert. There's no gap ever. <laughs> so it's like, when do we get out of this press? I don't know. They're not pushing us out. Let's keep going. Uh, it was spectacular. I think Questlove's one of the best drummers who's ever lived, and he's a great director and producer, so it was cool to be mm-hmm. that close to him. But my thing I wanted to touch on is last night, I went out and I saw Twisters, uh, the yeah. new movie, uh, by the same director as Minari, which I know Chris loves. He would never sigh under his breath or have an, el- an argument with me about that movie. But uh, I didn't what, argue about Minari. It's it's Drive My Car that's boring. I like, really well, like Minari. I think Minari's know, a great the, film. Yeah, no, no. Anyways, Um, So the important thing there is a a couple things. Uh, It is really cool if you want to just see like big budget, tons of CGI done extremely well. Um, They mix a lot of practical and CG stuff for all the storm scenes. It's very cool. So storm scenes in this movie, nine out of 10. Super fun. Had a great time with my kid. Um, The rest of it is it's kind of middle. Is it a direct sequel? They, they was a, a few small references, but no, I was hoping like Helen Hunt would just like drop in uh, and that does not happen. <laughs> Philip Seymour you Hoffman, want- unsurprisingly, doesn't show up. Um, so <laughs> that was a bummer thinking back to it. But one thing I wanted to touch on is the Glenn Powell, who uh, 
if you haven't seen Hitman, oh my God, check out Hitman. It's super fun. But he plays a YouTuber storm chaser in this. And there are so many jokes at the expense of YouTubers. I was really oh, hoping that Chris would be wearing his brother beard shirt. Cause one of my, like right as soon as they're introduced, they're like, never touch a man who has his own or never trust a man who has his own face on a t-shirt. And I thought that was just <laughs> delightful. <laughs> Is Glenn Powell, starry sky, AF sexy in this. Oh, like, I mean, he, yeah. it's not quite Hitman, uh, which he's okay. unbelievable. But no, he's like, it's been a long time since we've had like a movie star. Like, is it still like Tom Cruise? Or like, there's he's no, there's push. not movie he's stars anymore. This is like yeah. a movie star performance. Uh, so it's it's a lot of fun. I, I mean, it's, I'm not going to call it a great movie. I'd say it's like a seven out of ten with nine out of ten storm scenes. Were you but, expecting a great? Like, did you want this to be Top Gun Maverick for Twister? Is that what you were hoping for? I mean, I'm always hoping for that. But it was yeah. a very fun, well put together movie. So check check it out on a theater. I saw it on garbage 2K SDR projection, and it was still oh, a lot of fun. So go see it in like yourself. HDR laser four. Okay, and it'll look probably dope as hell except i'm gonna that. watch it on vhs okay go for it well original on vhs and then i'll dub this onto vhs for you when it's released on physical media yeah i want to i want a bad dvd rip okay okay well now that everyone knows what we're up to i will mention i did say that uh, chris and jordan are taking a vacation next week next week but do not worry we are going to record the podcast early so you will still have a podcast next week uh so stay tuned just for that. no fully produced Petapixel TV glory next week, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. But Petapixel we are still TV, working huh? on our vacation. Oh, Petapixel, the Petapixel YouTube. Sorry. I'm, yeah, just, no, I'm bespoke, TV. Jaren. And I don't like to hear that you're still working, but I appreciate it. We are still working. We are <laughs> <still> <laughs> yeah, we should actually take a vacation. At any rate, moving on, we're going to go do tech support, which we have a lot of. So we're not going to yeah, do, do never read the comments this week. It's just going to only be tech support. And we're going to power through as many of these as we can. And uh, yeah, we'll see where we're at. So first up is a hey. speak pipe from John Baker. Let's listen in. Hi, Jordan, Jaron, and Chris. This is John from Louisville. And I have a question about Micro Four Thirds cameras. Chris has mentioned that for him, the glory of Micro Four Thirds cameras is that they're rugged, easily transportable, and weather sealed, able to take on trips, etc. cetera. Um, however, Micro Four Thirds cameras used to be really well known for street photography. And so my question is, do you think now with advancements in full frame and APS-C cameras, is there any reason to use a micro four thirds camera for street photography? Um, you know, I'm thinking with the S9 and things like the Sony A7C and other cameras that are compact, um, but seem to be uh, offering better street photography capabilities. Where do you think the use of Micro Four Thirds cameras for street photography lies? And my challenge is I'd love to hear for each of you, if you were to put together a kit of the perfect Micro Four Thirds street photography setup, what would that be? Anyway, thank you so much for the podcast. Excited to hear from you. You know, I would say that Micro Four Thirds is still absolutely viable for street photography for the exact reasons that you just said. They're rugged, easily transportable, in some cases weather sealed. Um, and so absolutely. But, uh, it, you know, it's tough. When I, when I think about Micro Four Thirds that I would use for street photography, I would really go back to something like an older GM5 style of camera. Very compact. That would be cool, like a pocketable camera. And you know, kind of answer your question from my point a point of view. I would put on lenses like the classic twenty mil one point seven, the twelve to thirty two kit lens, which actually is a badass macro, even though it's a variable aperture. It's so small. Uh, you know, forget the seventeen mil, but you know, there's a nice twelve mils and stuff. There's nice nine mils. Like you have a lot of these flat pancake compact lenses. The forty two point five mil f one point seven, great little street photography lens. I would like to do that. If we're talking about micro four thirds cameras, like an OM one body, you know, I would absolutely use it for street photography. But then I feel like. I am getting into physically larger lenses. I still get the versatility of like 12 to 100. I could use it for that, but it wouldn't be really my tool. I feel like if I was comparing it to those larger bodies, I would then probably go to something like an A6700, my APS-C, or you know, some of the Fujifilm stuff, or 
yeah, like a Sony A7C or A7CR, like those are really cool cameras for street photography. And I would probably prefer the larger sensor for that situation, unless I'm getting a really substantial size difference with Micro Four Thirds. It, it just which sounds, is why they need to remake some of those. Yeah, cameras. It just sounds to me like the the now. issue isn't that the cameras haven't been good for it in the past or couldn't be good for it now. It's that the makers of Micro Four Thirds haven't produced the bodies that kind yeah. of lean this way. And then sure. instead gone Panasonic's way, which is for video, and gone Owen's way, which is for wildlife. They sort of Panasonic pick, can make a great GX they, series of camera again. They you both know, for could make a, yeah. what you're describing, but they are yeah. they kind of I think for budgetary and like goal reasons internally went with what they think they can sell the most of and that's what this ended up in jordan yeah i mean i went to exactly what you were saying jaron the two bodies i would grab are older uh might even be unavailable at this point so um of course there's the pen f uh would be Mm. my first choice for an olympus body because uh you've got that electronic viewfinder on it i find very useful tilt Mm. screen but the focus on it even at the time it came out wasn't as good as other less expensive (laughs) bodies in the olympus lineup imagine if that camera had a modern sensor in it with modern and their, and their modern autofocus uh i think Ugh. that would be a fantastic camera the other one is the panasonic gx9 i think would be a lot of fun um, but camera. those would be my two best options for going out and shooting street and then i would grab the panel like a 15 millimeter love that lens f 1.7 mm-hmm. that gets me a 30 mil equivalent so i'm right around that 28 to 35 kind of my sweet spot and a 75 millimeter 1.8 uh OM lens, which I rave about every other week. Uh, so you those two with those older bodies would be great. I just want a newer, more modern body. Um, yeah. From I either of them, like one difference. of you, please make yeah. it. Like, they need even to. make yeah. like the S9 body. We've said this before in Micro Four Thirds with that GH7 sensor would be a killer little street. And I said it last time too. Like that, if that Leica Deluxe Eight that we were playing with had a Micro Four Thirds sensor and a mount, that would be yeah. killer. Yeah. You know, put an EVF in there. Awesome, right? Like, that's what I want. I think the issue is these companies just don't have the the budget to take what they would consider to be a risk. Um, they don't have the I, stones for it. They don't have the stones for it. I think it, it's they don't have the money for it. Yeah. Panasonic maybe doesn't have the stones for it, but I don't think OM actually has the, the investment. <laughs> well, I, I do want to say we recently had Gordon Lang on this show and he was like, why doesn't OM system just crowdfund a Pan F replacement to see what the demand actually <laughs> yeah. is? And then I go on four thirds rumors this week and their front thing is like, hey, we've got a great idea. Why don't we crowdfund for a Pan F? And it's like, I don't see credit for Gordon anywhere. Yeah. On this. No, no I wonder where the they got that podcast. great idea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's all move right. on to a question from Frank. This is an email. Hi, Chris, Jordan, and Jaron. This is Frank from Philadelphia. I have a question about aspect ratios and the part they play when we talk about equivalent focal lengths and equivalent apertures. For the Fuji, Fuji film GF500 F56 medium format lens, it was mentioned that this is equivalent to roughly a 400 millimeter f4.5 on full frame but given medium format sensors have a four to three aspect ratio while full frame sensors have a three to two aspect ratio what exactly is the meaning of equivalency here my math tells me that for equivalent focal lengths it is computed based on the diagonal length of the sensors so is the maximum field of view that is equivalent and that kind of makes sense what about equivalent apertures how do we reason about those when comparing systems with different aspect ratios speaking of which i'm also curious what is your preferred aspect ratio when it comes to photography do you like the squarish four by three three by two thanks for all the entertaining and educational content you produced over the years you guys are amazing frank so i i guess the only thing i would say here is like I know you're talking about aspect ratios, but but really aspect ratios gets tied in with the actual physical sensors that we normally deal with, right? I mean, micro four thirds sensors are are a different aspect ratio. They're four three aspect ratio compared to the three two that we get in APS-C or or um, full frame. Um, but but really, what we're talking about is the sensor size for equivalency. And so, yeah, focal length, you're you're right, you're fine. I mean, we we know those translations. We make those calculations um, two times for micro four thirds, one and a half roughly for APS-C, and so on and so forth to get to a full frame equivalent. It's really the apertures that come into play because that's where you get into the real equivalency as far as light gathering, depth of field, and that kind of stuff. And so when we give equivalent apertures, um, for example, like the GF500 5.6 being more like a 400 mil f4.5, like let's just leave the light gathering part of it away because that's such a nightmare and, and, and everybody gets mad. But really when we talk about, we can talk about in terms of depth of field. So 
you know, a 5.6 lens on a medium format camera would give equivalent depth of field to a 4.5 aperture at that focal length on a full frame camera. And then, of course, you'll have different equivalences as you go down to smaller sensor sizes. Yeah. So the three things that determine depth of field are your focal length, your distance from your subject, and your aperture. Um, yeah. The actual aspect ratio is not part of that equation. So that's why no. we don't differentiate it based on uh, the aspect ratio. That's the simple reason. So uh, it just lets you know how much is going to be in focus and how similar the looks will be between two cameras. Uh, oh, aspect favorite, fo favorite aspect ratios. All right, I'll Jordan. go first. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I always want either wider or boxier. So my favorite aspect ratios would be a four by three uh, for photography, kind of my conventional frame. Uh, and then I love a two, three, five to one, kind of like a scope cinematic aspect ratio as well. Um, mm. Those are my two faves. So basically, yeah, I want to be shooting either medium format or uh, what was the Hasselblad super wide uh, camera called uh, X Pan. Those should be my two cameras. Ugh, too wide. What do you mean too, too wide? wide? Sorry, too wide. I, I disagree. I was about to say that um, <laughs> that super wide, like super long. I love it. Uh, David Amell, uh, shout out to the guy yeah. who I met in Tokyo and I now follow him and he has like the coolest photography. He did a shot of uh, yeah. the Golden Gate Bridge in like that super wide format and yeah. incredible. Love it. Dope. My favorite yep. right there. Yep. I You're just, wrong, Chris. You know, and I get it. It just, I feel like uh, picking a favorite aspect ratio, I'm not really big on. It's kind of like, they're kind of like... Uh, different brushes for painting. You know what I mean? It's like when it, when it works for the situation, that's the aspect ratios. Ultra wide aspect ratios are beautiful when they suit the composition, right? Six by so 24. So for me, yeah, I, I like to play with all yeah. of them. I mean, square, if I had to pick one, it'd probably be square. Uh, I, I think like for me, from a fun factor, I love composing for square images, but it's so rare. But I still like a traditional 3-2. I think that's a great compromise between giving you some of that wide look, but still, you know, very natural looking, very traditional. I think it's it's traditional for a reason. I think it's just an excellent ratio for most photography. But I like 4-3 as well. I don't know. It really depends on your intent and, 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 and it changes how you look and, and how you're shooting at the time when you, when you're using those. Um, so I don't know. I don't, I don't like to pick a favorite aspect. Well, ratio. just this week we put out our video on the deluxe eight, which has the aspect ratio switch on it. And yeah. I can attest that Chris far and away shot the most with the square aspect ratio, even though it's the lowest yeah. resolution of the settings. And maybe that's cause it was fun and I haven't gotten a chance to do it in a long time. Yeah, I think that's right? what you, you said know? in the video. I mean, yes, I could. Fun. Yeah, you know, but but I do love square composition. I think it's gorgeous. I wish there was dedicated sensors to it, even if they permanently crop a full frame. I don't care. Just make a square camera. I want my DTLR. Anyways, let's move on before I get angry. <laughs> but I like it when you get angry. All right, next one's another email. This one's from <laughs> Blaine. I'm currently living in Taiwan where it is hot and humid. I have a humidity controlled box set at 45% humidity for my camera gear. Is it a good idea to remove the lens and caps from the body and lenses to reduce humidity in the equipment? Thanks, Blaine in Taiwan. I don't know that it would make much difference. You know what I mean? Humidity is going to get into your camera regardless of lenses and caps and stuff like that. Um, it is It is a good idea. Like if you live in a very hot, humid environment where, where the humidity is just intense in the air, that is rough on camera gear, right? I mean, there's so many stories and you don't just get that in Taiwan. You get that in the Southern States, you get that in South America, you get that in Europe. It's like, um, there's always stories. People put a camera away in a cupboard and then, you know, they've got fungus growing on their lenses and stuff. Right. So you want to try to keep your cameras in a dry, cool environment if possible, just to avoid those issues. But as far as shooting in humidity, there's no real problems there. The, the key thing is you don't want to be taking cold cameras into warm environments, right? That's where you'll get condensation and condensation is obviously very bad for electronics, for glass elements, that kind of stuff. So you always want your camera to acclimatize slowly, um, often in like a sealed camera bag, just let it acclimatize slowly before you whip it out. This again can happen from an air conditioned hotel room or, or apartment into summer in Taiwan as easily as it can happen from, um, you know, like, uh, 
super cold winters here in Alberta and then you go into a store or into your house and all of a sudden you get condensation even though our humidity here is incredibly low in comparison. But as far as storage goes, great idea. Keep it lower humidity, but um, you know, just to keep it from forming fungus and damage. But I don't think the lens caps and stuff will make a big difference if you have it in one of those boxes. I mean, if, if it is coming in and the gear is has been exposed to a lot of humidity and it's like really high end professional gear, then it might be worth popping it off the body because the seals they focus on the most is that body to lens contact. But uh, honestly, I agree with Chris. I don't think either is going to make a huge difference. No, it's really the temperature difference. You got to be careful of that's, that's really very important. The next one is a speak pipe from Bob. Let's listen in. G'day fellas, Bob from Australia here with the tech support question. I'll try to be as specific as possible because I'm asking about gear. At the moment, I'm using a PC with an Intel i5, 32 gig of RAM, and just the onboard graphics from a cheapest chips MSI motherboard. Problem is it's got Windows 10, and I'm sick of the ball stuff that Windows brings with it. This obviously leaves me with one choice for my skill level, Apple. In my research into desktop Macs, I found the Apple Mac Mini with the M2 chip, 8-core CPU, and 10-core GPU. The price suits my limited budget, but I'm not sure if it will meet all my performance needs. I use the PC basically for basic photo editing in Lightroom and Photoshop, Blender 3D, an extremely old copy of AutoCAD, and the usual internet tomfoolery. I'm also planning on doing some documentary video work this year, so I'm learning DaVinci Resolve. Right, so all that said, is an M2 Mac Mini going to meet my needs, or am I selling a kidney and buying an iMac? Thanks, fellas. Love what you do. Hope you keep doing it. See ya. This is like a Jordan question. Jordan and Jaren, I think, because Chris doesn't use Macs. Yeah. Well, it, it's tricky for me because I have no perspective on the PC side. Uh, so, But anyways, I can say what I think will run comfortably because if you look behind me, that is an old, the very first M1 uh, iMac that I still use uh, pretty regularly if I just want to quickly do some photo editing. And I do actually use it for some video editing doing a basic timeline, uh, doing 4K, 10-bit. It still handles that just fine as long as it's not a very like if I'm doing a big involved 20 minute edit or whatever, it's, it's not going to yeah. cut it on this thing. Um, but uh, yeah, it is absolutely not going to uh, cut it. It's not going to cut. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I came up with that. That was a conscious decision. Oh my um, God. So no, top, I, top, I do think top, top comedy here, folks. Uh, no, an M2 Mac mini, I don't, I don't think you'll have issues with what you're specifically saying, mm -hmm. except for, you know, blender. If you're doing any of that kind of stuff, you're just waiting forever on it. I mean, it's, it's yeah, I'm shocked he's bit. using blender on his PC right now with integrated yeah. graphics on the thing is, when it'll you say be better I, now on the Mac. When you say i5, that actually doesn't help that much because they call an i5 can refer to anything from like an 8000 series all the way to the 15,000 series chips and the difference yeah. in power there is remarkable. Um, I think the M2 is it's great. It's a great chip. Uh, I don't think you should get an iMac. The iMacs are yeah. worse uh, than the Mac Mini and the Mac Studios. Um, I, it depends on how far in advance you want this computer to go. Um, an M2 Mac Mini will last you a decent amount of time. I think you're probably mm -hmm. going to start yeah. pushing it with the Blender stuff. Um, it's hard for me to recommend the studio because it's very expensive, but I really think the, the Mac, the latest MacBook pros are quite good. They're really powerful and you get a lot for your money and it comes mm. with a display. Uh, you don't necessarily need an external display, but you could use one with it. So uh, I'm with Jordan. I think M2 Mac mini is going to be fine. I mean, just dollar to performance. Those Mac minis yeah. are just staggering yeah. right now. And it's still going to yeah, be I mean, look. better than this thing behind me that I still use to this day. Yeah. yeah. As I understand it, the Mac minis are super powerful for the money and you would have to make build like a fairly strong desktop PC to really compete with those. If you're and, not and gaming. you'll pay more money. Yeah. If you're not gaming, yeah, if you're you're not, not gaming. And you don't need to buy like an NVIDIA GPU. Yeah. And you've already said yeah. you don't like Windows, which I disagree with, but whatever. I get it. So yeah, yeah Mac yeah. mini makes a lot of sense. Subjective sure. statement. Yeah. You'll probably be yeah. fine. All right. Next one. Moving on. We're going to listen to a speak pipe from CJ. Morning. Hope all well with both of you, or sorry, all three of you now. Um, it's VJ in London here. My question in the context of your recent comments about the Leica Deluxe 8 is, do you subscribe to the Leica look? I didn't used to, 
But the feedback I get when using my Q2 or even my old Leica T was always more positive compared to my Sony or Fuji systems. And it makes me wonder if there is indeed something to it. By the way, I'm a very average photographer and most of the audience I cater to wouldn't know a camera brand other than maybe Canon. So I think we can take that out of the equation. I don't think there's any sort of brand snobbery going on. By the way, um, great YouTube channel. It even managed to convince my kids who are redheaded 12 year olds, um, at least two of them are, um, to watch a camera program, which they ordinarily think is extremely boring. So thanks again for the work. And uh, thanks for being great evangelists for the um, photography hobby slash profession in general. We do it for the kids. Great. No, no, we don't. Great job, CJ. Uh, it's an amazing accomplishment. I can't even get my kids to watch my own videos. They don't care at all. So great job. Um, yeah, this is, I do subscribe to the like a look. I do. Um, obviously, I would still say like, if you're processing raw files, you can, you know, you've got so many presets out there, you can look at purchasing or making yourself or playing with or editing how you want to, you can make any camera pretty much look like any other camera. I, I don't, I don't subscribe to like a having really like a, a uniqueness that cannot be touched by other manufacturers, but they absolutely have a distinct look to their presets, to their profiles. They're black and white. I mean, we did an interesting video on all the black and white out of camera. That was really interesting to see that actually a lot of companies are now recognizing that and trying to make their monochrome profiles look a lot like the Leica profile. And yet there's still something they do with mid-tones and shadows and just the curve of it that's unique and beautiful. And so their, their color palette tends to be a little bit different. Again, you can change all this, but I would say out of camera, there's a unique look to Leica cameras and it is beautiful and people can recognize that. I think, I, I think contributes- it's really important to point out that uh, he mentioned the Q2 specifically. That lens is extremely unique. Like it's been around for a while now. They've used the same optic on the Q, Q2, Q3. Uh, and it has such a really interesting kind of fall off to it. The depth of field effects on it are really interesting. And the same thing with a lot of those M series lenses. Yeah, I remember I on an that. old podcast, Jaron, you talked about that, uh, yeah. that, you know, they like are really prioritizing is the optics. It's the glass. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and mm-hmm. there, there is absolutely a case to be made for it. Um, where I do think the profiles, you can really emulate it, or you can take a, like a look and make it look like any other camera out there. I didn't like the SL two until I put M lenses on it. And then I realized I didn't really like the SL two. I liked the M lenses. So it's, that's, that's what I think the look is to me is how those render. It's just, it's just so much fun. And I just really love, but it's subjective. Yeah. It is subjective. Yeah. That's why some people don't get it. And some people do, cause it's not the same for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, I mean, when I like we got the files from the Deluxe here, like they didn't jump out to me in the set. Like it's a good lens. Optically, the files are great. It didn't jump out to me as like a completely unique aesthetic to the images. All right, next one is an email uh, from yeah. Emad. Uh, I'm a casual photographer from the UK. On the most one of the most recent podcasts, you had a question about sensor sizes and whether there was enough different ones on the market. Chris mentioned micro four thirds, APS-C full frame and medium format, but I think there was an important omission, the one inch sensor with the RX 100 line type frozen one. type one. That's right. It's not actually an inch. You're right. Uh, with the RX 100 <laughs> line frozen for many years now, how come camera companies have abandoned the $500 in quotes market, even though the most recent RX 107 was more expensive than the first model at when it launched, that's what it means. We see premium compacts of yesteryear, like the R100 series or the PowerShot G7X, commanding high prices on the used market because, like many others, I also don't like the sterile, overprocessed images produced by smartphones. You guys brought up a couple of weeks back about the camera companies wanting to instead squeeze more from their current customers through APS-C and full-frame gear, but aren't they at risk of making photography a smaller market with an even bigger niche if there's no intermediate category between a smartphone and an interchangeable lens camera? Where will their future customers come from? Hope that makes a decent Decent podcast topic of discussion and keep up the great work. Yeah, it's an interesting question, Imad. Um, it is kind of like I look. I like all the sensors. I like the looks that you get. I like the benefits. Certainly, I could shoot one uh, what type one cameras and get nice photos that I'd be happy with. But I do feel like that is one where the smartphone really is starting to encroach. And like, there is absolutely a different look to smartphone imagery. Um, compared to traditional cameras but if you want to look at it on a tech basis or like a a statistics basis 
honestly, smartphone images can start to compete in a lot of cases with certainly Micro Four Thirds, even APS-C cameras. So, you know, it's tough to then make Type One sensors have their own realm where they can really do well from a from a technical standpoint uh, in comparison. Um, but at the same time, photography is about fun and about having different experiences. I would still prefer larger sensors myself. I, I like the RX100 uh, cameras when I played with them. I like the G7X, but I do feel like in most situations, I'd want a larger sensor. Oh, Especially since I've they're got putting a really one, good. They're putting Type Ones in smartphones now, so yeah, yeah. yeah but I, they don't use the whole thing. <laughs> I think basically, yeah, that's true. Actually, on the Sony Xperia's, but um, I we had actually a one inch five hundred dollar camera uh, come out in the last couple of years. That was the Sony ZV One F, which we also called worst camera of the year. And our yep. whole argument with that is like, in order to actually hit that $500 price range, they had to cut so many corners on it in terms of like sensor readout, the lenses aperture and stuff like that, that we were getting better results from, you know, a smartphone. Now, bear in mind, I'm not saying a $500 smartphone. I'm saying like, you know, an 800 to $1,200 sure. camera, but a lot of people will have that anyways. And I think if photography is important, they'll pay the premium for the better image quality on their smartphone. Uh, and yeah, straight out of camera, your smartphone images, I don't love the look of them either. I find them quite plasticky, but now we're getting more flexibility. Like Apple's Pro Raw is an absolute pleasure to work with. Sure. And you can make nice natural looking images with that. Uh, Good tools, some mechanical, like manual controls, which is nice. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of Android phones are giving you similar flexibility now. I know Chris yeah. has been like playing with some raw files from during our smartphone reviews and again, has gotten nice natural results for them. So I think this is just the natural thing of like, sure, they can try and make a camera at that price range, but in order to do it, knowing they're selling so much more limited quantities than smartphones, the It'd technology is just going to be completely behind. It's going to be behind it. You're buying it like kind of like the deal. The deluxe eight was an interesting camera to review because that really was, uh, you know, a, a crop micro four third sensor. It's like, we're really like getting into that type one territory and it's still better than a type one, but it's kind of in between a type one and, and a, and a full four third sensor, which is already small in the, in the realm of all the sensors that we normally use. So yeah, it's, it's the smartphones are only going to get better and better and better. And the image quality on the smartphones is to some degree getting more natural if you want it to be, it's just the, the target audience doesn't want it to be, but you can work around it. All right, next one is an email from Anonymous with the title Vlogger Battle Royale between G87 and Z8. This should not be a competition, <laughs> right? I'm looking at starting a legal podcast with a friend with the expectation that we'll use it for additional traveling footage on the side. Yet, while this should not be a contest given the Nikon's is full frame with some video assist tools, Panasonic's best in class stabilization, superior UI, and video assist tools, front facing display and audio makes this difficult for your lay consumer to understand the difference between the two flagship uh, cameras that are more than a thousand dollars apart. Plus, we see Jordan keeps returning to Panasonic for video production. As a stills camera, I understand Nikon's capability, but I'm not sure as to the extent to which Panasonic makes video easy. He's just wanting to make sure like, can you explain that a little better, Jordan? Yeah. Totally. I mean, if you want a hybrid camera, yeah, the Nikon kills the Panasonic. But if you want a dedicated video tool, uh, having things like the assist tools that we've got in Panasonic, especially now the 32-bit float audio is wonderful. And if you're doing uh, high-speed recording, like, yes, the Z8 can shoot 4K120, it's on the spec, but the Panasonic shoots it oversampled, so it's world sharper. Uh, what we're getting off of there. We have features like a fan. So if you are recording, you know, long uninterrupted takes, which you won't be doing for your travel footage, but you might be doing for actual podcast recording, uh, then you've got that advantage. That's why I'm using an S5 II. Mm -hmm. It has a fan. Uh, when we do the podcast, I don't have to worry about any overheating. Um, and the other big thing to check out is the lens selection. A big reason I keep going back to micro four thirds is there's the 10 to 25, 25 to 50 F 1.7s perfectly made for video with real focus clutches and minimal breathing. And there's not a lot. Well, there's nothing like that in any other mount. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have to factor that into the investment as well. But yes, I would say the GH seven is my favorite dedicated video tool right now. But if you want a great photo camera, that's capable of very professional video, the Z eight really kills it there okay thank you next one is uh another speak pipe this is from trevor from melbourne hey guys this is trevor from melbourne australia um so just have a quick question 
I am looking to buy a camera that I can bring into concerts. Um, so it needs to be compact um, and don't have any detachable lens. And I basically narrow it down to the Sony RX107, the Canon G5X and G7X. And yeah, just want something that have good video quality at the long end. Um, so what, what would you guys recommend? Am I missing some other camera? Or maybe I should just stick to my iPhone and save the money. Um, love to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you. And I uh, love the podcast. This is one I probably should have put after the previous discussion on one inch or type one. Sorry. Since <laughs> that's basically what he's asking about here. So like this, what are, you, yeah. what are your thoughts? Is he missing anything? Don't, don't use your smartphone to telephoto. They're all bad at, at this point. You know, they keep touting their big tellies we're not there yet um so i mean in terms of a long reach that really is the rx 107 that gets you a 200 millimeter equivalent on it uh i believe it's a 120 with the two canon models that you mentioned uh so there is a real leg up there um the only other thing i might mention i know you can't have detachable lenses but if you can find yourself an rx um uh rx 10 version 2 or version 4 uh, it's a bigger body, but those are going to give you fantastic quality at the telephoto end, yeah. even though their autofocus is out of date yeah. right now. Yeah. Nothing to add, Chris? No. Okay. I mean, you're, Aha, you're there it it's is. tough regardless. <laughs> I knew you were going to have something tough. to add. All right. Uh, next no, one nothing is a, to add. <laughs> this one is an email from Zach. Hi, guys. I really enjoyed the podcast. I wanted to comment on something I heard on the podcast recently, that there are no adequate open source raw developers as alternatives to Adobe Lightroom. While I would be inclined to agree with such a statement regarding Photoshop, I would suggest people who haven't given Darktable a serious look to do so, and people who prefer who did prior to version four, give it another look. It is considerably more refined than it was a couple years ago and very capable option for those willing to spend a bit of time with its ex excellent documentation. I'd also like to ask that you turn on the Fediverse sharing for your threads profiles, which will allow people to follow you from other services like Mastodon. Also, here's a bird, beautiful bird for Jordan's viewing pleasure. I'll put it on screen. It is indeed a crow. Great. Wonderful birds. Um, you know, my nephew was recently attacked by magpies while he was trying to clean a, a yard. So them birds is mean. It. Yeah. Corvids is mean. Uh, go ahead. Take pictures of them all you want. They're boring looking <laughs> birds. And uh, this is a good photo. But um, uh, I but I'd say rather take a picture I of a did, different bird. I did turn on Smart Fediverse sharing birds. <laughs> I turned it on for the Petapixel one and I turned it on for myself a while ago, but I can't turn on Chris and Jordan's because I don't have their logins. So they will have to do this themselves we'll if they do want that. to do it. Um, Darktable is one of the more popular options for folks who don't want to use Lightroom because there are not very many options that are good at both culling and editing like Lightroom is out there. Like you can find Photoshop alternatives, but the Lightroom one is the most difficult. And I can't say I've used Darktable yeah. ever. Chris? No. I, haven't, I haven't tested it. Yeah, uh, we're, we are starting to use some third party options, uh, like looking at my sidebar here. I got Photomator and Pixelmator Pro. Those um, are like photoshop so though. They are, yeah. Um, well, actually, no. Uh, if you go to Photomator, that's more like a Lightroom style program. The problem is yeah, I keep true. reviewing brand new cameras and I there's not raw no support, support for them yet. Yeah. We just keep going back to that. So I got to grab an old camera, take some pictures or reprocess some old ones. And uh, yeah, I, I'm going to start playing with some of these alternatives to have a more informed opinion. Um, yeah. Chris, you've been, have you been using any other processing software? You know, it's like fly fishing. All right. Everything is. So I have, I have a lot of R.L. Winston rods, premium rods, beautifully made, quite expensive. And, you know, they're joy to fish with. But I still get tempted every once in a while, as expensive as those are, to maybe build my own rod or try a different brand of rod. And, you know, when I'm building my own rods, it's a lot more work. It's a lot more research. It's a big investment in time. And then, you know, I feel like I'm getting something that's away from the mainstream and it's going to be really good. And then I fish them and I always find that although it entertains me for a little bit, I keep going back to those nice Winston rods because 
as expensive as they are, I know what to expect. It's tried and true. It fits me well. I like the look of it. And so it's very tough. I always feel like going to something else is going to be a novelty or a distraction. And I haven't yet found something that, that really competes the way that I want it to. So I find myself stuck in this very expensive premium kind of situation. On that topic, I did hit a wall this week where I just said, Evelyn, that's it. I'm renewing my Adobe subscription while I was trying to convert using right. Adobe DNG converter to get some files into Capture One, which I love uh, to process them out for our review. And it was just like, no, this is maddening. Uh, I had DNG converter crash on me a couple times. So it's like, I'm just... I'm going to suck it up and get Lightroom Classic again. Damn it. So, yeah, there we are. I'm it back. Sucks. On Adobe's it taking sucks, bucks they, from me. It's such good software. It's the Arl <laughs> Winston of, of uh, software. So, on this note, uh, actually, anyone listening to this, we have one more th thing I'm going to go through, but I, I will mention this now. I collected a bunch of comments that we are going to ask Adobe when we go down to see them in a couple weeks. I'm encouraging everyone to do it again. If you've got some questions you want to make sure that we answer, put them in the comments below or send us a speak pipe. And uh, we'll, we, if it's it's one that we think they'll, they'll answer, then I'll toss it at them. And uh, the more you send, the better it is. Because right now, I don't even think I have to ask anything. I have enough that essentially rolls all questions that came to my mind you guys asked too. But I'm happy to keep hearing more. Please send those. And with that, we'll do our last one. It is from David Kennedy. Kennedy? Kennet. It's a merch message. So this is they sent through our store. Camera manufacturers Ooh. never publish the specs or benchmark their processors. In contrast to the CPU industry, AMD, Intel, Apple, etc., and even cell phone SOCs, they have benchmarks like how many watts it consumes, how fast gigahertz it can go, how much RAM and or cache is available, how much the bandwidth, the thermal limits, etc. I wonder why camera manufacturers don't do that. It would be nice to actually quantify or benchmark the differences from one generation of processor to another. I understand specs aren't everything, but it is also not nothing to gloss over. Is there anything, is there any reason why they don't publish it? Yes. They don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> and also, <laughs> the, the one that I found to be the, the funniest version of this was, I don't know if they still do it this way, but Sony refuses to even tell you if it's a different processor in their camera than the last one. They don't put a number on it. It's just the... What, what's the version? What's Bion? It's just it's just uh -oh, the Bion's, Bion's processor. Yeah, Bion's. Bion's X. Yeah, they say they add an X. Or the something, X has been know? it's been an X for a very I, long time, and I'm sure yeah, the processing Panasonic powers Venus. changed. Yeah. I remember yeah. specifically asking, and I think it it was. I remember he even told me, and they looked at me and like we just don't say that. And it's like, okay, yeah. well, yeah. that's not helpful. Yeah, they don't have to. They don't want you like benchmarking processors from one make against another or even against themselves. Because uh, yeah. yeah. they, again, they don't have to. Yeah, it stinks. It's a mystery. That's a good question. I mean, it'd be interesting to know because processing power is actually very important in making cameras more powerful, especially mm -hmm. nowadays and unlocking features and stuff. But uh, yeah, it's it is funny that they never explain that. They just say the most we've ever heard gotten is like, oh, it's got more onboard RAM and a larger cache than it did yeah. before. You know what I mean? That's how we can get the buffer rates to go through faster. Like it's just they're very cagey about it. They don't look. Tell if Canon's not going to give us like the nit value of the brightness of their EVF, they're not going to tell yeah. us the <laughs> RAM in their processor. Like it's they all should ready. just have. They right. should just have a chart that's like, is the processor capable of showing you the on-screen level and histogram while recording video? Yes or no? And it'll be no on every single camera that they've produced. I mean, uh, people know. Like, they're obviously just, like, using other manufacturers' chips, right? Like, I think Canon no, makes I don't know. their own, actually. Uh, I'm, I'm fairly so? certain they do. I'm actually fairly certain they do. That's they why Toshiba's in there and Matsushita's in there and stuff. I don't know. Like, you know, Panasonic might make their own. Who yeah. knows? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a mystery. It's a very good mystery. That's something to uncover. If anybody has insight deeper into that, yeah, leave comments. It's also like, how would you even benchmark just the, yeah. the chip? Like doing in-camera raw processing and looking at your time frame, but there's so many variables in that, yeah. right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, no idea. Uh, but they I've always mention them. Every press event, every, every, every you know, sort of like... Um, new product launch they always mention in the presentations has the new latest processor Bion's x or venus engine or ask them to go into detail on it and like, they're like they, no they always no. they always make a point to to state it but never to qualify it yep yeah. super weird i agree david it's, it's unfortunate there's nothing we can do about it uh unless you've got an idea on how to benchmark but feel free to submit that <laughs> 
Um, and thank you for we, uh, for supporting us on the store too. Yeah. Appreciate it. If anyone else would like to support the store, we, we actually added a couple new hoodie colors. Uh, Store.petapixel.com. Check those out, uh, guys. Thanks for joining me this week. Uh, we'll we'll get together a little later this week to record next week's episode. But uh, yeah. with it. more updates on Jaren's hand every week, <laughs> yes. more details. <laughs> you want to see? You have to show it. Roll it. back one bandage a little bit. You don't, every, you don't love that. Yeah. You know, it was oh, gruesome. It'd be the it's weirdest terrible. striptease you guys have ever seen. Blech. All right. If you usually you watch, I'd switch to listening when that episode. No, goes. we're not done talking about your gross thumb. Yes, um, we are. I'm cutting us off. That's <laughs> it. Thanks, everyone. Bye. You're cutting it off. Don't cut it off. You already tried that.